thank you all for being here during this uh, lunchtime special. Uh, my very uh, special thanks in advance to Andrew Plepler for answering all sorts of multitudes of, of questions. They'll mostly be nice. Um, <laughs> Uh, Andrew is uh, Bank of America's, he's in charge of Bank of America's corporate social responsibility and he's a, a, in consumer policy, is that, that is yeah. correct? Uh, and what we want to do over the next hour is have a conversation and we want to make it as interactive as possible, so, so, so please be prepared. Uh, if you don't have questions, we will do a sort of Socratic method at some point. Um, you know, where I wanted to start with this actually, is you have this title, corporate social responsibility, that's in your title. Is this a made-up title? What? 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 <laughs> I certainly no, hope like, not. Was this a market? <laughs> was this a marketing thing? When did when did you get a title like that? What what was that about? Well, it's it, it's interesting you ask that. I I, I certainly, uh, in my view, it's real. Uh, it's uh, and it's an increasingly significant part of the company, in my in my humble right. opinion. And I think that what happened was it used to be philanthropy, and I think the evolution coming out of the financial crisis that corporate social responsibility and how companies conduct themselves and what our role is in society is now an evolving issue. And so you really morph from philanthropy to a broader corporate social responsibility agenda. And I think coming out of the financial crisis, you have to have a healthy recognition that that's gonna be a evolution of people really believing that's real. And that's the journey we're on. When, when you think about that journey, how much of that journey, though, and, and I'm going to be the, the, the resonant uh, skeptic or cynic here, is about marketing. Um, that it's about the community only to the, to the degree that it ultimately is really actually about the shareholder. And so people, you know, banks and all sorts of companies have participated in philanthropy for many, many, many years uh, and have done all sorts of things and talked about stakeholders, but it's all in the name of the shareholder. Is that right or wrong? Well, it's not all marketing. I mean, marketing people will see through very quickly, um, particularly now given the skepticism. So if you walk into a room and, and just simply lead with, hey, listen to all the great things we're doing without having a healthy appreciation of where we've come from and our role in the financial crisis and the lessons we've learned and the reflection and soul searching that we've engaged in. If you don't acknowledge that up front, nobody wants to hear about you know, your environmental initiative or your philanthropy or your volunteerism. So it has to be real and you have to be able to have a meaningful conversation of what has the company really done? Um, to make corporate social responsibility a core part of the enterprise rather than leading with a marketing initiative. Let me ask you, let me ask you we talked about this yesterday when I, when I saw you briefly in the afternoon. When you read history and, and you look at Wall Street and banks over the past century, you could look at the 80s and 90s and perhaps even the early aughts before the financial crisis and you could argue that there was a moment at which Bankers were lionized. They were uh, put on a, a special perch. They were um, uh, they, they they were described as people that, that lots of people um, aspired to be. And I don't want to suggest that you should not continue uh, to want to be in that role. But if you look over history, there's a question of whether that was sort of a, 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 an aberration that period, um, and that. Historically, at least it appears to me, that bankers were never really like this, kind of like the cable company. Um, I, and by the way, I have a relationship with Comcast as an employee uh, through uh, NBC and CNBC, so uh, we are all uh, my own conflicts right here. Um, but you know, I, I just raise it because I wonder when you think about the bank, Bank of America in particular, but perhaps banks writ large, what do you think the goal should be in which the public, everybody in this room and elsewhere, uh, perceives this world? What are they supposed to think? Well, I think they're supposed to have a healthy degree of skepticism, given where we are today. Um, I don't think we were as, probably as great as we were when we were lionized, and I don't think we're as bad as we are today when we're looked at as a pariah. Um, and I think the encouraging thing today is that it is viewed as good for the business to get this right. And in an earlier session with Keith Banks, my colleague at Bank of America talked about 75% of millennials thinking about social values-based investing 
That's, they want to put their money in companies that are practicing good corporate social responsibility. So there is, a, there, there is now a blending of shareholder value and good behavior and good governance that is core to how the company is run. And do you think those things are intrinsically linked? Uh, meaning, you know, I go back and think about sort of the Jack, the, the Jack Welch era and also this sense of, of, of shareholder value to some degree at all cost, right? We, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and we, we lived through that and everybody uh, focused on shareholder value, shareholder value, shareholder value. There are now investment funds out there that are looking um, mm -hmm. at social responsibility and other types of metrics, if you will. But the question that I imagine if you are a pension fund manager or frankly uh, anybody who's looking for a yield, if you will, they're trying to find companies that not, not only have the shareholder value but actually will have the highest returns. And so the question is, can you get high returns and do shareholder value if, or, or, or uh, social uh, responsibility, if you will, at the same time? Yeah, I think you have to today. I mean, I think you're not going to be successful if you don't get the returns. And I don't think you're going to get the returns if you're not a responsible company. So we have suffered through, at Bank of America certainly, the reputation hit that we've taken over the last five years has been devastating to the company. And in the eyes of shareholders, in the eyes of the public sector and the media, um, right. I mean, how many days are you on air talking about our challenges and our own employees? It has not, the morale at the company has not been great over the last five years. You cannot be successful if you're going to retain and attract the best talent at a place with bad morale. And I think today, particularly with young people looking for a place to work, they want to know that you're getting this right. And so, it, you know, if, you, if it's employees you're talking about, if it's your reputation amongst countless stakeholders in the investor community, they're all thinking about these issues. And if, and if you don't get any one of these right, you're going to suffer uh, as a right. company. I truly believe that. Over the past five years, what would you say is the biggest change, shift? And in terms of how did you approach it? What did you say yeah. to yourself? Well, I think that there's a, a, long, I think there's a realization that these issues are long-term issues. So, and I think there's a recognition that it is no longer um, just, hey, these corporate social responsibilities over there, these guys do philanthropy and when we need a... So how did your job, you came, you came to the bank in 2003. Right. So how has your job changed? Well, it used to be just philanthropy and volunteerism. This whole CSR notion of running a portfolio that includes meeting with the consumer business on a weekly basis, understanding how are we thinking about fees, right. how are we thinking about overdraft fees. So um, do you walk in and you say, no, no, you can't, you can't charge the overdraft? Well, how does that work? Well, it's a dialogue, I would say. Um, it's a journey. And that's what's good. You know, there's a, there was a great, Joe Nocera wrote a great column yesterday about um, the emerging culture at Ford and how they would have these weekly meetings. Alan Mulaney would have, when he'd call his senior execs, and they'd all say, everything's great. He said, we're losing billions of dollars. How the hell can everything be great? And finally, Mark Fields, who's now going to be the CEO, stood up, raised his hand and started talking about the challenges and having real debate internally in the company, Ford righted itself, and his point in the column was, GM doesn't yet have that culture. And I think our culture is now, we do have that debate. So I go sit at the consumer table, I sit at the mortgage company table, which is pleasant, <laughs> and, and we have honest debate about whether we should be doing more on loan modifications. What should our, we got way ahead of the industry on overdraft fees. I don't want to get into the weeds um, after everybody's had hot dogs and they'll all fall asleep. Um, but we went, we got out ahead of the industry in terms of being cons consumer friendly practices on overdraft fees. Gave up short term revenue, but over the long term did what I think is right for the Customer so how, but right how does that conversation? I just want to know how that conversation goes because I imagine somebody sitting there saying, yeah. "If we don't do these overdraft fees, this is going to cost us right. X, I don't, five hundred million dollars, a billion, whatever the more." What's the, you know what the number? You probably know up top. I'm of your not going to tell you. I mean, oh. I'm, I'm going to be in the deal book column, and um, <laughs> but 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 you look at those numbers, and you're you're probably arguing to them, you know, long term we're going to we're going to get this money back. 
we're going to get this money. So are you making an economic argument to them? How do you? Yeah, I'm making an economic argument. And again, this is, these guys are saying, look, the investor, we got to go in front of analysts who are going to say, how much is this costing? And, you know, it's really customer choice. If people want to overdraft, they're prepared to pay that fee, be transparent. And then people like me are saying, I've brought consumer advocacy groups into the company in front of those executives to have to say, here's why we view, you, you say you're gonna be transparent, no hidden fees, and not be punitive to your customers. This doesn't live those principles. Right. You guys need to make a change. And in the end, for us, that debate won the day. It doesn't win the day every time, but I think Brian Moynihan has made a stake in the ground around customer first. Right. And this was consistent with those principles, and we did it. And I think long-term, it's been the right decision for the company. But play out the long-term versus short-term thing in corporate America right now, because one of the things, and I've argued this in, in many columns, we still, in a, we still live in, in, in a short-term world. Right. I would argue we live in that world not just because CEOs and boards live in that world, but perhaps even more importantly, we all live in that world as individuals who have investments in these businesses. If you look at the average uh, turnover in an actively managed fund, many of you may, be, uh, may partake in these funds strictly through your 401k plans, literally 99% of the fund turns over every 12 months. And right. so I always argue, you know, we are living in an ADD nation. And it's, right. our, it's as much our fault as it is, uh, as it is yours, because you're doing what the shareholders uh, who aren't so, there for that long anyway want. So if you had this discussion and you looked at, if people had thought during the mortgage crisis, um, long term, had a long term view of the originations of product that went out into the marketplace in 2006 and seven and no doc, no mm -hmm. income verification, and you had had a long, those create, generated a ton of revenue for a year or two and you know, we, by buying Countrywide, have paid $50 billion um, for the sins of, of an acquired company. So if somebody had, had a long-term view of how's this gonna play out over the long-term, um, we'd be sitting on a month, much healthier share price today right. than we are. So when, when you say, and the, the, the title of this session uh, is called uh, A Place at the Table, Necessity for Business for, for Global Development, what table do you want to sit at? <laughs> And do you think right now, five, almost six years now after the financial crisis, you are positioned to sit at that table? Yes, I want to sit at any table other than the mortgage company is really <laughs> the, ta the table that I'm actually interested in sitting at. But I think, look, we, we entered into a partnership with Sal Khan um, right. and Khan Academy around better money habits. Um, and Sal Khan, um, I don't think would have entered into that partnership with us five years ago. Um, so we're sitting with one of the great innovators in education around how to, how to actually get people to think differently about how they live their financial lives and practicing better money habits. That's a partnership that wouldn't have been possible five years ago because our brand was so tainted. Um, with Red, you know, we launched this global health initiative with Red and mm -hmm. Bono and, and- I think I'm um, wearing this, is this one of yes, yours? You, yes, it, yes okay. it is. You can, we'll donate, we donated $10 because you're to wearing that okay. to uh, the Global Fund um, for the eradication of mother to child transmission of AIDS. I don't think we would have been able to enter into that relationship with the band and with the Global Fund five years ago. So the tables we want to be at are who can help leverage? We've got enormous resources and capabilities, both financial and marketing as a company, that can be harnessed with the right partners to actually accelerate social impact in the world. When we do it right, and when we're at our best, that's right. the role we can play in society. So we wanna be at those tables with public sector, nonprofit, and business partners that can help leverage what we, what we bring. I imagine you also wanna see it at the table in Washington. Ah, yeah, I forgot that. You forgot um, about yeah. that table. <laughs> and, that is an important table these days. Um, and I uh, happened to be at a session earlier this morning, around 9 o'clock this morning. Larry, uh, Larry Lessig uh, spoke. And he spoke about the, what he described as the corruption of politics because of money. 
and the role of money and wealth and, frankly, corporations in our electorate. Where do you think the, what, is, what do you think the role for a business, whether it's Bank of America or any other business, should be in the conversation? Well, the conversation is they're diminishing public sector resources to address, I mean, we're, we just announced the Clinton Global Initiative, a partnership with the SBA. So the SBA is trying to generate you know, loan guarantees for this, what they call the missing middle, $50,000 to $350,000 loans to small businesses. We come in with the SBA and through an innovative partnership um, have provided capital training and grant dollars that enable these community development financial institutions to do more small business lending that's going to be guaranteed by the SBA. That's going to generate $100 million of new lending in that category of loans that wasn't being serviced, served in the, in the community. Um, that's a table. That's a conversation we went, we approached the SBA. They needed a private sector innovative financing model. That's a, that's a very constructive partnership. Now, does that help restore our reputation in Washington? Absolutely. And the and more- And will, will you do that profitably? Yes, we'll do that. This is out of a, out of a, sm a community development financial institution portfolio in our company that will generate smaller returns, but will generate returns that is not philanthropy. So, oh, that's interesting. So when you think about, you, so this part of your business, you say smaller returns. And do you say, I will accept smaller returns in part because, as you just said, you get a seat at the table and walk? I mean, how do you think about that? Well, we think about it as a responsibility. We're prepared. This is not, we're not going to do this. As, we get paid back. These loans perform. So right. this, is a, this is a billion dollar portfolio which in the relative scheme of our company is not enormous in a trillion dollar balance sheet. It's a billion dollar portfolio of loans that generate smaller returns but don't lose money. The, the credit people in the company have sort of acknowledged, right. we're gonna do this because it's a, it's a responsible thing to do. Um, it fulfills our mission. Um, it's an authentic commitment right. to serve the community. And yes, it absolutely, helps in terms of restoring reputation and showing that when we're at our best, we're a constructive partner right. in, in society. How should we feel about the role of banks or companies in lobbying? And the reason I ask is, you know, post-financial crisis, uh, we saw the Dodd-Frank bill go through. So much of that bill, frankly, was written, at least initially, by lobbyists, paid for by banks. And it goes, to, you know, talk about social corporate responsibility, talk about Larry Lessing and, and his view about money and wealth and what, the, what it's done to politics. Where do you come out? Good. You, you, when we did our prep yesterday, you didn't mention <laughs> you, were, you were gonna go. I didn't think of this, gonna, but actually, uh, go Larry, ins lobbying, Larry right? inspired me yeah. this morning uh, <laughs> to, uh, to think of some of this stuff. You remember that. Um, <laughs> look, Brian Moynihan was an early proponent of, he said, look, coming out of this financial crisis, there's going to be more regulation. That's, uh, that is a responsible response right. to the financial crisis. He was one of the early CEOs to actually back Dodd-Frank, back the CFPB. Um, we were not out there, um, you know, block. Now, there were things that we offered advice and comment on, and there are things that we feel where the pendulum has swung too far. Um, so we're going to be a we're going to be in the dialogue, but I think we've been a responsible contributor to the conversation. Right. Do you think, you know, I wrote a book called Too Big to Fail, but today I worry more, or I worry less about the firms being too big to fail and perhaps uh, more about them being too big to manage. Yeah. You're, inside the, you're inside this behemoth. I mean, this is a big, giant bank all over the country. And when you think about the culture and you think about the corporate social response and all of those things that you're trying to... Is it possible to do at a company of your size and magnitude? Yeah, I think it is because I think it starts from the top. If you have a CEO that day in and day out tries to influence the culture of the company, I think you can do it. Now, Brian has shed $70 billion of non-core assets of the company. We've simplified the company in a, in a very significant way and it's become easier to manage because we're not doing a lot of extraneous things. We're sticking 
to five core businesses and Brian hammers this home at every town hall. The, the focus of the company is simpler and more narrow. Is it big? Yeah, it's still 230,000 employees, it's still an enormous place and it's complicated and it's not probably as nimble as it could be. Um, but we continue to try and simplify the company so that it's easier to manage. But if you get the culture right, I think the size becomes less of, of an influence. If the culture's poisonous, the company's not gonna adhere to these principles and values. If the culture's right, and I think it is today, under Brian's leadership, then I think everybody feeds off of that. Right. You touch the consumer portion of the world, I think, for the most part. So you touch the worlds of mortgages, as we discussed, uh, overdraft fees if you, if you have a consumer product. Then there's the investment banking product. They're the traders. Do you talk to them about corporate social responsibility? I, I do. Um, and what does that I, mean? When I get invited to, to their meetings, um, it's, it's a harder conversation. But I'll tell you something. There's a, in, the, in the corporate bank, um, there's a municipal finance team, public finance team. Um, they're enormously interested in this stuff right now because they're going to large bond issuances, RFPs, and they're getting asked these questions. W what's your philosophy on corporate social responsibility? As we're deciding who we're, who's going to issue these bonds in, in public finance right. or municipal finance or hospitals or universities, so all of these public finance and municipal finance folks in the company now are coming I mean, So what do you do? Me, you know, you heard post financial crisis. Frankly, we've heard for so long, you'll, you'll hear stories and you'll read stories in the paper, and not necessarily about Bank of America, but all sorts of banks who will issue bonds and, and try to help municipalities. And on a moment one, boy, do these look like great deals, right? And help build the school, whatever. And then five, 10 years later, all of a sudden, the municipality is, is not doing so hot. And there's a whole discussion about you know, was, this a, was, was there predatory lending going on? Did the boards of the municipality actually have a clue? Were they, uh, you know, did, did the banks take advantage of them? How do you think about, well, has that changed in terms of the thought process well, the, and yeah, getting that, involved in certain types of loans? I mean, that's a separate question. I mean, that goes to the whole underwriting, right. um, which is a different conversation than whether the municipality is actually willing to work right. with us because of the kind of company we are. And has that changed? I think it has changed. I think we're in a much better place. And now th these guys, my colleagues who come to me saying, um, you know, tell me more about our environmental initiative and the green bonds, because this particular municipality is really interested in that. They're actually um, being invited to the table right. to bid on deals that I don't think we were engaged in four or five years ago when people didn't even want to talk to us. And the same thing on the environmental side, meaning how, much, how, how big a piece of that is now? part of your business? We have a $50 billion environmental initiative, so we did about $2 billion of, of deals and renewables in 2013. So our energy bankers um, are very bullish on the renewable as, a, as just pure business. business. And it contributes to we're able to do some very innovative financing, and it's, it's been very good business for the company. And it's also really important on all these issues that we've been talking about. Right. I don't know if you can try to define it, but I'm curious, if you were to look at the short-term hits across the, across the bank that the bank has taken to enact more socially responsible, I mean, I was trying to get a number on, on, on the mortgage piece, but sort on of, the overdraft or, or an overdraft piece rather. Mortgage uh, piece, I'm happy to tell you, because it's public, it's $50 billion is what we've the, the overdraft fee, I mean, I'm not right. being cagey about it. I mean, it, it's hundreds of millions of dollars, but in the, in the long term, um, we've seen fewer complaints from customers. We've seen higher balances. I mean, all these things that offset what you give up in the fee, we're seeing on the other side of it. And I would argue the long-term business case, um, complaints are the most expensive thing a bank deals with. Um, people start calling and complaining and calling again and emailing Brian Moynihan. Um, Believe me, you're happy to give up some, some fee revenue if you can get after that issue. Right. And in terms of how you think, for example, there's a settlement uh, that's in the news. Uh, $12 billion is the number. Um, apparently, Ryan wants to go visit with um, 
Eric Holder, I don't know if he's going to get that chance. Jamie had that chance, so maybe. Uh, but when you think about even... You don't think I'm going to answer that, do you? Well, I, haven't, I haven't asked the question yet. I haven't asked the question yet. No, no, but... I, Usually people ask me about our grants and like, you know, uh, our volunteer it. activity. We're going to get into that. I'm, we're not done yet. And with the audience, may, you know, they, have, they might have their softballs ready. So. Exactly. Um, I have colleagues here. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, but I, what I, I guess what I was going to say is when, when you think about, for example, you're talking about the mortgage issue. And there's going to be this big settlement of some sort, whatever the number is, I don't know. And I won't even ask you to comment on that piece of it. But what is the calculus around not just a settlement, but around, for example, how, you, how you're dealing with the modifications? And, when, and does that constitute part of this corporate social responsibility thing? Or is that, do you put that in a totally separate category? No, I think it's absolutely part of the corporate social responsibility. I think the issue you have is in the honest debate and... There's no question that um, you know, penalties need to be paid. I don't think anybody's objecting to the right. fact that you, know, uh, you didn't need to have some compensation for things that occurred during the financial crisis. I think the position of the company at this point is how many different lawsuits can you pay for the same sins of, a, of an acquired company? And reasonable minds can differ over that. I think we're feeling a little fatigue, obviously, from it. And it, at what point do you begin to look forward right. in terms of allowing the company to unleash all of the positive things that we can do right. in society if you're still fighting, you know, how long can you still fight the battles of the past? I get it that people feel that there hasn't been sufficient um, you know, penalties paid and that people haven't gone to when jail. Do, when do you think that'll change? I, was at, I remember being asked about a year, right when Occupy Wall Street uh, began, someone said uh, to me, how long does this sort of, the, the, whatever this go on for? What, what, do, what do you think the answer is? Well, I think, you know, I didn't answer the second part of your question, which was how much of the consumer relief part of people actually getting help is part of the corporate social responsibility. I think as part of any settlement, there's a large part, and I think we're very committed to this part, which is getting every person who can be saved a loan modification. Any person who has the ability to pay or ability to stay in their home should get, and, and we should absolutely um, do everything we can and commit every resource we can to, um, you know, to, to, to get those modifications done. I think the, the you know, the part then, the, the more punitive aspects of any settlement are what right. become more challenging. Um, but I think the modification pieces is um, we're still you know, right. putting enormous resources behind it. When do people stop talking about it? I think you're starting to see people now focused on a little bit of the path forward. How do we, how do we play a role in revitalizing neighborhoods and economies and creating jobs and dealing with big intractable problems? Um, and I think you're starting to see, instead of 80% of the focus being on mortgage, um, you're now starting right. to see it in more of the 20, 30%. Okay, range. so now that we're through the hard stuff, tell us all about your volunteering and the grants. <laughs> just an open-ended. Just, just, you know. Just an open-ended. No, I like these questions. Um, I don't know if you saw, J.P. Morgan announced a $100 million commitment to yeah. Detroit two weeks ago. Yeah. When you look at it, at, at something, and got a lot of press, uh, Jamie went on the Today Show in the morning. Uh, it was it was all over the place. Yeah. And and it, and it looked good, but how much of that do you think? Again, and I know we keep going back to the same issue. It, it, the market, the marketing piece of yeah. we want the institution to look good, and the investment piece, and how much? Do you, how how? It, I just want to really, I guess, understand the sort of psychological shift, if there is one, or if there's just a sort of side group that's thinking, we, we should do a couple of these things over here because that will really make the rest, you know. People like, I mean, I think the job of people like me and the company are is if this thing isn't real, um, we're in trouble. And if you're going to go out and make an announcement, you better make sure that the program has teeth to it. Because believe me, people are going to ask you a year later, where did that $100 million go? And was it real? 
how many homes did you know were you able to demolish and and you know get blighted properties offline? Um, and they'll ask JP that. Everything I've heard from being in Detroit, and this is a huge issue in Detroit, is they did a very smart thing and they did something that's going to help the land banks and help a real need in Detroit. And I have no reason to think that that's not an authentic initiative right. that they then did go out and market and say, look at us, we're addressing a real serious problem in Detroit at a time when everybody's talking about Detroit. So I don't resent anybody going out and marketing if the underlying program has teeth. Where you get into trouble is if you're marketing smoke and mirrors. And I think people today know the difference. Right. Um, I think on that note, we should try to open it up and see uh, if we can get some other zingers in here. Um, <laughs> try to keep it fun. We got a, a handful of hands and a couple of mics. Why don't we uh, go right there? You project and I'll repeat. How significantly is, is Merrill Lynch doing that? Like, how significantly is Merrill Lynch integrating long-term thinking as a part of its investment analytics? This, this was a long-term versus short-term question, and how do, you get, how do you get investors to buy into the longer term? And specifically, how is this working in the context of Merrill Lynch? Well, I think, you know, um, Keith t uh, Banks talked this morning about a study of high net worth individuals that, that U.S. Trust did a survey and that saw that these millennials are very willing to think long term in their values based investing. And they don't have the millennials don't have a lot of money. Well they will relative, they, they will they, one day. They, but I'm saying right now, they're they're not the ones who are activist investors well, who are gonna kick out your CEO yeah, but you're seeing if you don't make your numbers. You're seeing this though in mutual funds and institutional investors who are putting um, real dollars into these socially based, socially responsible investing programs and platforms. And I think you know these, this is still their psychology. I mean, you're gonna, you're being, you're being a cynic, thinking that as they age, they're gonna somehow their values and principles um, and interest in values-based investing is gonna dissipate. And I don't think we see any indication um, because you still, even in the baby boomers, you still see this very real interest in socially based, socially responsible investing products. So I think there is a huge, I'm not saying everybody thinks this way, but I think there is a huge market out there that's willing to think long term, that's, that wants their investing to reflect their values, and are willing to, you know, willing to take more than a quarter to quarter approach to that. Um, so I, I, I think that it is still, it's not every investor, it's not gonna be for every investor, but if I'm betting on the long term, I wanna be the company that those investors are willing um, to bet on. I think there's a question right up here. Hi, Pam King Sams. I'm the CEO of a foundation in Washington, D.C. And I actually did come to hear about <laughs> your social <laughs> responsibility and how you're thinking about it as a company and what you're looking for when you're thinking globally about public-private partnerships. And um, you gave one example of the, the AIDS and, and RED and, bon and Bono. But what are the things that you're doing now, and what are you looking to do in the future, and who are you looking to partner with to do it? Well, I think that that model is sort of replicable depending on the issue and the partner. So RED was sort of a fortuitous introduction of Bono, who's obviously been committed for a long time to the eradication of HIV, um, partnering with the Global Fund, and it was an opportunity um, that came to us to provide marketing and philanthropic support um, to that initiative. So I think we think opportunistically about issue areas that are relevant in local markets across the globe, whether that's global health, um, whether that's the environment is obviously a huge focus for us and sustainability, um, and increasingly hunger 
um, globally are issues where we've we've identified partners with in the environmental space. It's largely around businesses, um, and where's the renew you know where's the real investment um, to make renewables uh, um, you know come to life. Where are those opportunities? So the partners aren't going to always be nonprofits. They're going to be businesses, and they're going to be public sector partners. Um, and I think that depending on the issue, we identify those um, those partners. Um, we have no necessarily sort of uh, uh, limits as to who will who will work with. If that answers your question. I think we have a question over here. Before we do that, uh, real quick. Social bonds, we haven't really yeah. talked about social bonds. Are social bonds real? Or are they here to stay? Yeah. Again, is that a marketing gimmick? You're, you, uh, uh, the, the Gates Foundation has, has, has done a number of them now, yep. I believe with one of your competitors. Yeah, they do. Um, yep. But this idea that a foundation will effectively backstop a but bond. That's not sustainable. If, the foundation, if you're going to need foundations to backstop the bond, to, to, Let, we should explain to the audience, for those, for the, yeah. for those uninitiated, I can do it or you can. Go right ahead. Um, I think the best way to explain it is, for example, in the Gates uh, uh, Foundation situation, uh, they have backstopped uh, a specific a series of bonds such that you, your losses um, are, you, you are, 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 cover, are covered. First losses will be picked first up First losses by are covered by the foundation. Dollars. And as a result, uh, but, your, but your, uh, your gains are also capped. Right. On the other end, right? Is that a a, a going to become a trend? Is that I, a one off? What do you think of? I think that it's got to be market based to actually reach any kind of scale. So the the one that we did, right, um, in New York, um, does not have philanthropic backstop. So it's all um, private investor dollars, thirteen million dollar bond issuance to deal with recidivism in New York, and if if the if it if it actually lowers the public sector cost to dealing with recidivism, the investors are going to get a return. If, they, if it doesn't, um, they're not going to get a return. But I think that's going to be the model if you really deal with the ability to lower public sector dollars being put into some of these social issues, um, there will be a market for those bonds. But I don't think the model where you need philanthropic right. dollars to absorb the first and that's, loss. But uh, is the municipality in that case, is New York City guaranteeing any of that? No. So no. it's completely and utterly market-based? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, I think there was a question right over here. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, since we live in a, a global economy, and since our best ideas uh, are being regularly stolen by uh, people in, around the planet, why is it that this particular notion of, of financial responsible investing hasn't been picked up much outside of the United States and Canada. And then the second part of my question is that uh, if that's true, does that put us in some kind of competitive disadvantage? Yeah, I think I would disagree a little bit that it hasn't been picked up. I mean, in the UK right now, um, there's, there's, actually, um, there's actually federal reg national regulation around um, some corporate social responsibility principles that are going to be mandated. Um, and I don't know everything. I mean, it's, it's still new and it's not even effective yet. But there's, there's an enormous sort of movement in the UK around taking corporate social responsibility and actually putting it into regulations. In India now, we've got, um, there's a mandate that you, certain percentage of profits be invested philanthropically. Um, which we're, we're starting to have to deal with and how they define your profits in India. But I think you're actually starting to see this now emerge with a, um, outside of the US. And I would argue that Europe is actually uh, ahead of us in some of these principles. Would you advocate for some of the things they're doing in India? Or when you say you're having to deal with them? Well, I, th well, I think the philanthropic, you know, again, I don't want to get myself in trouble with um, National government of India, but um, uh, I think that there's a. I, I don't. I'm not a big believer in in the in the in the mandating of a percentage of dollars that go to philanthropy. I think it's. Um, I think that's operationally very complex. I like to see the fact that I think in the marketplace, the companies who get this right and do it right are going to be successful, and I think that's a more scalable right. model for this. 
I think we had a question right over here. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Jason Saul. I had a question regarding measurement and um, how do you measure the impact of what you're doing in two ways. One, the social impact and show meaningful return. But then how do you measure the link to financial performance? So for shareholders or CEOs, like we're spending all this money, how do we actually show that this isn't just a nice thing to do or it's in some obtuse, three times removed, far reaching way, you know, impacting our reputation, but how do we actually quantify the value that you're creating through the work you do? Yeah, it's a great question. It's the most, it's obviously the most difficult question we get, um, the one we struggle with because um, our individual contribution to some of these issues is very hard to isolate, particularly in philanthropy. If you're one of a hundred funders of an initiative, it's really very hard to, to get at what was your contribution to the success um, or failure of a particular initiative. Um, so we struggle with that, I readily confess. I think where you're starting, some of these behavioral economics um, models, I think, are encouraging. I mean, we just met with these guys from Ideas 42 about how you can measure better financial savings and better financial money habits, because that's a big initiative of ours, and whether you can actually, actually see whether people who watch some of these videos start saving or start changing their behaviors. I think you're going to have to do it in small increments, um, pick some of those big bet initiatives and actually put some dollars behind evaluation and, and measurement. Have, have you started evaluating? I mean, I've watched, by the way, if you haven't had the opportunity, I will plug it right now. Sal Khan has made some pretty awesome videos. Yeah. Uh, whether you are uh, completely sophisticated about economics and, and, and uh, numbers and money or not at all, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. But you know, well, what he's done is he's taken you know, the old model of telling people to go down to the community center every Thursday night and take a financial literacy class is just, people don't have the bandwidth for that. And what he's done is people can do it on their own terms and digest. Have you seen forms. a benefit? I mean, the question that I That's had was the people who are out. focused on Sal Connor, it's a self selecting group. Yeah. Um, and most of the people who are in the sort of Sal Khan universe actually happen to be sophisticated, at least the, the, the older set. Yeah. Uh, who's interested. So you, you haven't been able to measure out. Not what? yet, but we're actually rate, and we've only had the partnership for a year, and now we're trying to figure out can you get at some of these behavioral changes and see if they're real. Right. Um, the second piece of that question was just on the, um, for the shareholder, um, whether you can begin to measure. I mean, we're, we made it on to the, for the first time last year, the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, um, which presumably tracks, you know, Fortune 500 companies um, who, uh, and share price of those who make it onto the index, which is, you know, one of the more respected benchmarks. And I think the best we have today is they say that the companies who make it onto that index are outperforming um, you know, the general Dow Jones index. And I think what you're beginning to see is company, it's intuitive in some respects, companies who are governed better, practicing better ethics, better uh, responsible practices are actually performing better in the marketplace. Yes, sir. In the middle there. Uh, I actually was wondering, um, you mentioned a few times that there's about $2 billion invested in renewable resources. How much is invested in non-renewable resources, <laughs> like coal, oil, natural gas, that type of thing? Well, you, were, you must have been at our shareholder meeting. Um, <laughs> um, the, I mean, what we have said is um, that we have seen our trending for investment in renewables is increasing. We expect that um, to continue. Our investment in fossil fuel and coal was decreasing. We expect that trend to continue. Um, and we have seen, um, you know, we have made it a policy. Mountaintop removal is, is an area that we do not intend to um, uh, finance going forward. So I think from a trending standpoint, we've seen um, much greater trending in our, um, in our renewable portfolio um, 
than so in our which parts portfolio. of the business are you not going to finance anymore? Mountaintop removal. Mountaintop removal. Is there any other businesses that you've said? Demi for we will be phasing out our mountain. Right. Are there other businesses removal? that over over? Well, that's a you know um, we just you know this gets into governance and we Brian just named an enterprise wide. Um, committee on corporate social responsibility where some of these issues are right. actually going to get debated um, by people. No, I'll, give you, I'll give you an interesting one because I, I cover a lot of deal making. Um, over the past year you've seen what's called a number of uh, inversions. These are tax inversions where yeah. big American companies are seeking to buy companies abroad uh, where they're going to then relocate their headquarters in part to lower their, their tax rate. And, and invariably I am sure uh, Merrill Lynch uh, at Bank of America and every other bank in, in the country is trying to advise on these transactions worth worth, which are worth millions upon millions of dollars in fees. Um, at some point, as part of your role, do you say to, do you, do you say to some committee, you know what, I don't, I don't think we should be, uh, we should be playing in this, in this game? I thought we were in the audience part of the questioning. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, yeah, I think those are the kinds of. These are I mean, this is balls. a new this is a new issue, right? Um, but I think that's an issue that we will, um, you know, the, absolutely that this, you know, we will. Those are the kinds of things we will, um, we will dialogue on. I mean, uh, right. at the company. I mean, we haven't that one. We inversion. It's a new we one. Haven't gotten I know. That yet. I know. Um, we only have a couple minutes left, so if we want to sneak in one last question, perhaps we can do so. I don't know if there's any hands. Not right here. I think there's two hands there. Yep. Thank you. Uh, more of a comment than a question. Uh, I'm a business person, and, and I believe, uh, like I think you do, that businesses are complex systems that have customers, employees, owners, communities, and to try and focus on only one sub-optimizes the whole. And that's what I think I hear you saying, and, and I agree with you. Uh, also, I've been on a couple of public company boards and uh, we have ignored uh, short term uh, to try, and we're looking for long term investors. And uh, if that's not your cup of tea, don't invest in us. Right. Uh, so just a comment, not a question. Yeah, no. I think that's. I think it's a great, uh, probably more articulately stated than I did, which is um, that you have various stakeholders, and I mean we debate these issues. I mean coal is one that is probably front and center and is debated in a lot of financial institutions, do you or don't you? And you have people who say it's not for us to make public policy. Um, you know, we have regulations and we finance, you know, legally regulated businesses and it's not our position to de make social policy and, and, the, and, and public policy. And you have other people who feel that is a, you know, if you're committed to sustainability, um, the phasing out of fossil right. fuels is imperative and you have a role to play. So it's a multiplicity of stakeholders, but you got to follow the core principles of your company. Right. Should we take the final, final question from, from the, the gentleman in purple? To what extent do you incentivize people beyond your department uh, throughout the organization to come up with great ideas? And then the flip side is, and to what extent do you unreward people who don't live the values? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, it is the whole performance culture of the company at this point, and, which is changing and is not solely based on revenue, um, which is what it used to be, or products sold, or all of these sort of metrics. And today, there is a very large part of culture in the performance review process. So I would say that it's moved much more to a qualitative performance review culture than a quantitative culture that it used to be. And that's, that's a huge shift. Um, it used to be people were rewarded for however many products you could push out, and now that is no longer the way people are recognized from a compensation standpoint. Okay, we're going to leave the conversation there. Andrew Plepler, Bank of America, thank you for the conversation. Thank you for your questions, everybody. Thank you.